So the first uh, religion we'll look at in this course uh, is an ancient religion, and to the best of my knowledge, nobody really practices it anymore. Uh, it's, it's the Egyptian mythologies. Now, uh, it's easy to look at Egyptian mythology, to look at the pantheon of gods, and to listen to the legends, and to you know, see that they have a god of air, a god of moisture, a god of the sun, a god of the earth, a god of the sky, and to think that this is really just kind of all about, you know, they think that superheroes are in charge of the elements or something like that. Yeah, it's easy to think that. It's easy to think that they are just merely primitives and they have really active imagination or, or something. It's easy to do that. But, you know, it's something that I'm trying to teach you all this semester and something that I hope you learn along the way is you know, if you don't take a person or a group seriously for at least five minutes, you'll, you'll never understand them. And the point of this course is to understand these different religions. Okay. So, it, like I said, it's easy to kind of dismiss what they're doing as the ramblings of you know, folks that aren't technologically advanced. Okay. Um, but there's something more happening here. Right? There's something more than just mere, you know, superheroes char in charge of the weather. Right? No, there's a lot more. So uh, I want to uh, take a look at uh, the mythology. Now, I'm not going to try to list all the different deities in the Egyptian pantheon. <laughs> that would be here for a long time. I'm not going to try to explain them. But I am going to highlight the uh, primeval, primeval gods and see if we can't figure out a kind of a major theme running through the rest of the mythology. So the first thing I want to look at uh, is what I'll call the enemy, <laughs> and that's chaos. Chaos is more or less the enemy in Egyptian mythology. Now I say more or less because the relationship with chaos is a little complicated. So first I'll, I'll just start out with how it's you know how it is, is the enemy. Right? Um, none is chaos. None is this um, you know a non-existence. It's not actual existence, it's mere potentiality. It's merely what could be, but not is. So, you know, if you really kind of take this apart, you understand it a little bit. Nothing exists in none. No people, no gods, no ideas, nothing. These are just potentials, right? Just the potential for existence. But what potentially exists doesn't actually exist. The potential in a sense, is there for unicorns. Right? But no unicorns, but it's just potential. Right? No unicorns actually exist. So none is potential, is chaos in this sense, because nothing's there. It's not what is, but only what could be. And what could be, right? There could be unicorns, there could not be unicorns. There could be dogs, there could not be dogs. There could be, uh, you know, 40,000 story buildings. There could not be 40,000 story buildings, right? That's why it's chaos, is all this is happening and, and not because it's merely potential and not actual. So this is chaos. This is the enemy. Now it, it's the enemy in the sense that uh, this world for the Egyptians, all of this, is going to end in chaos. Ra will eventually give up and, and take everything back to nothingness. But it's also the source of everything. Um, the first land formed out of chaos, and it, it was, you know, chaos is kind of pictured as the turbulent waters, right, which is an image used by a lot of cultures. Uh, you know, think about it, you know, the turbulent waters, you can't exist there. Um, you can't live there. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of the source of your own sustenance, because, you, you know, you fish out of the waters, and you know, miraculously, this living organism appears out of the dark, murky depths, and you can eat it, right? So you can sustain yourself off of this. Um, so, you know, like I said, the murky waters, are, the turbulent waters, are the kind of image or the metaphor for chaos, for mere potentiality. Um, but the first land was formed out of chaos, and the first god appeared on this land. And it wouldn't, the first, presumably, the first god wouldn't appear without something to appear upon. Uh, and it was the first creator god. It's either uh, atom. Uh, it's, uh, 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 it's either raw, 
uh, Amon Ra or Ra Atom, depending on what the mythology is saying. Um, the first god appeared on this land, and you know, some sense came out of, maybe is a way to say, came out of chaos. Now, the, uh, at least in some of the mythologies, there are these kind of gods of chaos, the uh, Agdoad, if I'm pronouncing that right, Agdoad, I, I don't know. I'm going to say Agdoad, see if that works. Uh, there are these gods of the chaos. you got Nun and Naunet. These are the gods of the primordial, of the turbulent waters, right? Uh, there's what's moving back and forth uh, uh, amongst chaos. Um, then you have Kek and Kekhet. These are the gods of darkness. The god and goddess, I should say, of darkness. Nan and Anet are the god and goddess of turbulent waters. Kek and Kekhet, the gods of, uh, um, uh, of the god and goddess of darkness. Amon and Amoret, these are the, this is the god and the goddess of invisible power. It's an interesting phrase, invisible power. And then, uh, finally, uh, Hek, is it He, Hehet, Het and Hehet, the gods of boundlessness, boundlessness. Now, I can't pretend to be an expert in Egyptian mythology, I don't know where these various gods came from, but, you know, take a, just take a minute and, you know, and take a look at what these gods represent. They, they each look a lot like, you know, the ocean. It's the ocean. You've got water, you've got darkness, you've got invisible power, you've got boundlessness. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you, you know, imagine that you're just plopped out in the middle of the waters. Right? No land in sight. Um, if you plummet to the depths, supposing you survive, if you plummet to the depths, you will see water all around you, all around without boundaries, boundlessness. It will be dark because you're you know, sinking to the depths. And you'll feel waves and you'll feel pressure upon you as you enter that water. But you won't be able to see from where it's coming from, right? That's invisible power. And there's the water themselves. Or there's the water itself. So it's not hard to see where some of these uh, images for these uh, gods came from. The metaphors, what they came from. And what the Egyptians are trying to do is they're trying to understand chaos. Right? They're trying to understand nothingness and mere potentiality. Right? So it's, it's easy to dismiss what they're doing, but they're trying to comprehend right, the disorder from which things come. Okay, so we have the enemy, chaos. The hero is the opposite of enemy, order. Chaos is Mere potentiality, but nothingness, not existence. Order is existence. And not even just mere potentiality, right, because that's chaotic, but what actually exists, what comes to be. Okay. So this order, this order fights back against chaos, fights for its own survival, fights to, you know, avoid being reduced to nothingness again. And for uh, order, right, we have the Ennead. We have uh, the nine creator gods. Now, again, the the beliefs, the mythologies vary depending upon which period in, in history you're dealing with. But the idea, but the Ennead is, is basically this: you have the first god, the one that appears on that mound, right? And this first god creates the other eight of the gods. So first is yeah, I'm going to skip the names, right? So <laughs> just I'll, I'll use what they what what they are, what they represent, what they are. Uh, first, you have air and moisture, right? Air and moisture. This is the first pair. This is the first god and goddess uh, created by the first god. Air and moisture, in turn, give birth to uh, earth and sky. Right? Give birth to earth and sky. Now you notice what's happening here. You got air and moisture, and you have earth and sky. Now, let's be you know pay attention to something real quick. The sky is not the same thing as air and moisture. Right? We're we're used to thinking of the sky as being the atmosphere. But that's not what's happening with the Egyptians. Uh, the sky is different than uh, earth and moisture. In fact, your know, earth and sky in, in, in the mythology, earth and sky embrace so tight and uh, uh, become pregnant that you know the, the children can't come forth. Right? So it's up to sky to come in and separate. Excuse me, it's up to air and moisture, or excuse me, that's a air. <laughs> it's up to air to separate the sky from the earth and to give the living creatures air to breathe and room to move about and be free. Now, 
as I said, it, it's kind of easy to look at this and think of it as some kind of fanciful imagination. But look what the Egyptians are describing. They're describing an order upon which everything can exist. Ground to walk upon. Sky to keep back the turbulent waters. Air and moisture to breathe and to give life and sustenance to plants and animals. That's the stage for life. That's what these creator gods do. So on top of, you know, in addition to the you know, earth, sky, air, and uh, uh, moisture, right, uh, there's two sets of twins. Uh, Osiris and, I and Isis. And Osiris is the king. Right? The king establishes government, which is order and society. His sister is his consort. His, uh, uh, well, I know it's kind of disturbing to think about, it, but it's it's his uh, um, his. We would probably use the word wife. Then you have uh, uh, the other pair of twins, uh, Set and um, I can never pronounce her name right. Uh, Nephthys. Think Nephthys. I can't pronounce her name. I know somebody's going to get in the comment section and say this is how you pronounce it. Fine, let me have it. <laughs> um, and Seth is the enemy. Right? So you have a hero, a king, an, uh, keeping order in society, and you have the enemy who's trying to fight against the order in society, Set. Uh, and, and, you know, Nephthys uh, despises her brother, Set, and, you know, even you know, kind of t looks after Osiris after he's been, after he's been killed. Now, with these primeval gods, right? First god, air and moisture, earth and sky. They set, a, they set the order upon which everything can live. All, all living things can live. If there's no land, they're drowning in, in turbulent waters and chaos. If there's no air, they can't breathe. Right? And without air, plants and animals can't live and sustain existence. Without a king, there would be chaos in society. There would be anarchy, disorder. People would be doing whatever they you know, want to each other everything else. And, you know, maybe the Egyptians, are, you know, you might wonder, well, where does Set come in all this as well? Order needs a, a champion. Well, so does chaos. So does chaos. So, when we're look, so this is, you know, what the Egyptians have given us, they set this kind of stage, this explanation for order. You have the enemy chaos and all creation uh, uh, if it's if everything that exists, if it goes back to chaos, it ceases to exist. But even in, you know, even in that, there's there's an order. There's a cycle of, uh, uh, in a sense, reincarnation, rebirth. You know, yes, right now everything exists, but it's going to return back to none. And then after, I guess, some time or something like this, uh, it will come out of none once again. So there's even the cycle of existence, right? which is an inherent order to the disorder. Right? Or at least an inherent order to existence and non-existence. Okay. And the gods, these primeval gods, set the stage. They set the pattern. The, uh, they set the uh, very conditions for life and flourishing and happiness. So remember that we are analyzing or trying to understand these religions in terms of three main concepts, faith, belief, and action. Right? And for the Egyptians, right, their faith is in order. Their faith is in the struggle between order and chaos. And order is on their side. That's existence. Right? Chaos, mere potentiality, non-existence, uh, will destroy them. Now, even, and again, as, as I said, even in, in that destruction, there's still going to be a triumph of order because existence will simply be reborn. So this cycle, this struggle between order and chaos, between existence and annihilation, between uh, uh, Ra and Nun, this is what the Egyptians have faith in. They believe this order is going to be the source of, uh, their fulfillment is going to be the measure by which they achieve all that they can. And their hero, right, uh, 
Osiris, Ra, is the one in whom they have faith. They have order. They have faith, I should say. They have faith in existence and society. So now we come to the beliefs or doctrines uh, with Egyptian mythology. And in, in one sort of way, um, there's really not much. <laughs> there's not much because there's uh, uh, n not a whole lot that's very permanent. You know, the mythology's changed from century to century to millennium to millennium. And they're around for 3,000 years. That's a long time to have a culture. The United States isn't even 10% of the way through that. So. And in some ways, uh, there's not a whole lot, but another way to look at it is there's just too much, because right? the, the mythology has kept changing. <laughs> it depends on which period in, in Egypt's history you want to consider the mythology before you can even start looking at the beliefs. So, uh, in terms of doctrines, there's not a whole lot. I mean, most of what we have regarding the Egyptian mythology is, is written on, uh, it's written for funeral rites, it's written on coffins, or sarcophagi, I should say. It's written on, on, on temple walls. Um, and that's, you know, like, that's where the, we get most of the mythology. So we don't have too much as far as beliefs for the Egyptians, other than there is this struggle between Nun and Ra, and, and the mythology surrounding Os I mean, at some point it looks like Osiris and, and Set were, uh, were brothers, they weren't twins, but they were brothers, and they're enemies. Um, and it looks like Horus uh, was a, a, was another hero and a son of Osiris. So some of those things you, you can easily read uh, the material that I gave you and start listing some of the some of those relationships and you know, the individual deities and and the heroes and the enemies and figure out the relationships between each other. Um, there's something like an afterlife right, for uh, for this Egyptian mythology, but. The main emphasis that the Egyptians had, or the main uh, thing that mattered the most to the Egyptians, wasn't a set of beliefs or doctrines that they write down and memorize. Rather, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the cultic worship. So now we have the actions for Egyptian mythology. Now, the actions that mattered the most to the Egyptians were the cultic worships. The cult, of, the cult of worship, the rituals that they performed in order to maintain this battle, to keep up the battle against chaos. Right? They, they thought that the worship, the ritual, is what um, allowed Ra to continue his fight against Nun. Right? That is what maintained the balance in Egyptian society. If you messed up the rituals, uh, Egypt was thrown into chaos. Uh, the Nile wouldn't flow right, or um, uh, you know, people would die, right, or society would fall apart, or whatever. Right? So they believed that the and what the worship really is is maintaining this relationship with the deities, yeah. and everybody had their own proper god. Not everybody worshipped Ra and Ra alone. No, you had your own god, probably depending upon what you had to do. And so gods of agriculture, you worship, or you maintain worship for uh, for the gods. Or if, you, if your god was the Nile, right? You maintain worship of the Nile. Right? Okay. So what ma what mattered the most for the Egyptians here was not the beliefs or getting the facts straight. So it's maintaining that worship, maintaining that ritual, maintaining that contact with the gods. And when you did that, you help maintain order. So also for the Egyptians, you had your actions in your physical life, but there was also an afterlife. And this was also important. When you died, you were judged. And what's kind of interesting here is, you know, reading the description, the judge was not somebody else. It wasn't one of the gods. Rather, the judge was you. Right? Your soul was weighed against a feather. And if it was heavier than a feather, and by that they meant that your conscience was heavy. Right? If you regretted actions, if you thought you did wrong, if you, you, know, you worked against society, against order, uh, and that weighed upon your conscience, well, you condemned yourself. That condemnation was, uh, I believe, the punishment, I think, was being eaten by uh, some kind of 
horrible lizard. <laughs> um, but if you did well in society, if you maintained your place, if you did not uh, condemn yourself, right? if you're, uh, you know, you honestly reflected on your life and you thought you did well in society, regardless of your station, then you got to join the fight against chaos with Ra. Right? You got to join him in that battle. So, in, so to reiterate, in Egyptian mythology, it's your actions that matter more than your beliefs. So, I've talked about at least some of Egyptian mythology. Now, again, I haven't given this grand exposition on all the gods of Egypt, right? But I think we've touched on what, you know, what kind of starts it all, the underlying structure for all the mythologies. And it's this faith in order. It's this faith in, you know, the value of existence and, uh, as opposed to just mere potentiality and the, and the value in uh, hierarchy and structure to society. Okay. Uh, and again, it, it's it's kind of easy to dismiss what they're doing as some kind of primitive imagination. So, all right, I mean, you can say that, but let's be honest, that imagination has not left us. And we have, you know, the Egyptians have their cosmology, okay, but we have ours, and we talk about the Big Bang. And there's lots of ways to describe the Big Bang. <laughs> Some people will say, you know, what? where did the Big Bang come from? And you say, well, nothing. There was nothing before the Big Bang. Well, that sounds an awful lot like saying this world came out of none. Right? It came out of chaos. Existence, just coming, popping into existence from out of existence. Uh, we talk about the cycle of the universe, right? And we talk about, uh, the, you know, at least some theories about uh, the universe is that uh, the universe started with the Big Bang right, from a singularity and exploded all the matter ejected out into the universe and is currently heading outward, right? But at some point gravity is going to take a hold of everything and, and bring it all back together in the Big Crunch. And then after the Big Crunch there'll be a Big Bang. Well, it kind of sounds like a cycle of existence and non-existence, existence and non-existence, just like uh, everything will go back to none. We, uh, <laughs> uh, there are even theories that uh, this world uh, is one amongst, amongst the infinite possibilities of worlds, right? or that we exist amongst all potentiality. Again, that kind of sounds like this struggle, this, I just, uh, relationship between chaos and order, between potentiality and existence, but, uh, and actuality, between you know, non-existence and existence. You know, we're still grappling with the same questions. We're still grappling with the same uh, sorts of issues. And as far as, you know, you can look at the Egyptian cultic worship and say, mm, that's some weird stuff. Well, you know, we devote people's lives. We devote resources, time, money, People risk their lives, and people have died and the, in our pursuit of trying to understand this causal order, in our pursuit of trying to understand the causal laws of nature and the composition of, of uh, various objects, and at bottom, what is really matter? We have our own devotions to order, to understanding it all. We call the project science. <laughs>